So, suppose you're estimating some unknown parameters. That's a lot of what we do, right? You can kind of boil down any kind of data science task into estimating the parameters. The parameters tell you what the function is, and that tells you what you're estimating. So a lot of times you can estimate. You can think about trying to find these unknown parameters. What is better? Is it better to be unbiased, or is it better to be biased, or is it depends? And of course, there is kind of an obvious seeming answer. What do people say? 10 people said it depends. Uh, nobody said it's better to be biased. Three people said it's better to be unbiased. And of course, the answer, as always in life, is that it depends. So sometimes it's better to be biased. Sometimes it's better to be unbiased. Unbiased is kind of like fair. So you kind of think like, oh, it's good to be fair. That's a good thing. Um, so unbiased has a very specific meaning. And sometimes you want to be unbiased. So if you would like to know the value of something, if the parameter really means something, uh, maybe you want to be unbiased. So unbiased is kind of like fair. Uh, but you got to be careful because biased in real life, like when you talk to people on the street, and biased in statistics uh, are not exactly the same thing. So let's make sure we understand the definition of biased. So biased is a special word. It's one of these special math words that has a special meaning. Uh, and unbiased. Unbiased. I guess unbiased is the one that has the definition. And bias just means not, not unbiased. So if someone says bias, they mean not unbiased. And what do they mean when they say unbiased? They mean the mean is correct. The mean is exactly, exactly correct. So the expected value of the thing you are estimating, uh, what should we call the thing we're estimating? Well, a good parameter, what's a good parameter? to estimate. Uh, let's do p for parameter. Yeah, p is a good parameter. So the expected value of p hat, p is the parameter you're estimating, p hat is the estimate. On average, you should get back the real parameter. So the real, this on the right hand side, we have the real value, the real value. And on the left hand side, we have the estimated value, right? And the estimated value is not a perfect, it's not exactly equal to p. But on average, if it is equal to p, then we say it is unbiased. And of course, this expected value is over data, right? So you pick some random data, and you estimate it, and you get if you If this is true, you call it unbiased. Otherwise, you say it is biased. So does this have anything to do with the word bias in real life? Not really. The word bias, when you talk to people on the street, you say, oh, you're being so biased. You know, like, it's got nothing to do with this. So I, don't, I think it's a bad word. I think we should have named it something else. But I guess the people who named it, uh, that was a long time ago, and we're stuck with it now. Maybe a better name would be on average correct or something like that. Uh, the average is correct, anything like that. So that's what bias and unbiased mean. That's what we're talking about. And so unbiased is a nice property, but it turns out you can sometimes do better by being biased. So sometimes, sometimes bias estimators estimators do better. And this is kind of mind-blowing. Like you would think you at least want your estimator to be average, on average right. But sometimes it's better to not be on average right. On average, you're just going to say, on average, I'm wrong. If you average up all my guesses, they are wrong. Uh, and that will still do better. And we'll see why in a second. Any questions or comments so far about the definition or anything? So we're going to see a few different examples. Um, and we're going to start with some very simple uh, thing here. Uh, just estimating, I, I mean, I should say they're dice rolls, but, uh, but really they're Gaussian variables. So here is the problem that we're going to start with. Very simple problem. Given n data points, which are all independently drawn from a Gaussian, with some secret mean, we would like to estimate the secret mean. So we're going to do the problem where the parameter is the mean mu, and we just want to estimate mu. So the problem we're doing, if we're given, given x1, x2, all the way up to x and data. So we're given some number of data points. And all of these are drawn from some Gaussian with a secret mean. So the, the secret mean is the parameter we're trying to estimate, secret. And I'll even tell you it is uh, variance 1. So this is a vector. And this is all in R to the n uh, 
of r's, the number of variables. So each one is a vector. Let's, let's make them vectors. So you're given some number of samples of vectors, and you want to estimate them. OK, so in the little uh, uh, code, I did this. I repeated this game n samples times. So we repeat, repeat n samples times. OK, in real life, you don't get n samples. In real life, you get one sample. Right? You get one data set. So this is what makes it a little bit different than uh, real life. This is the math version where we're seeing what happens. We're repeating it some number of times. And I can do that just as I can hit run again. Right? I can run the whole thing again. And the question is, how can we estimate this mean? How can we estimate what is our estimate? So how do we estimate? mu hat secret, the estimated version of the mean. And by repeating it many times, we can see how close we are and how much error there is. So to start with, uh, what is the next thing that's written here? OK. So here is the code that generates everything. So I'm going to do four samples. So I'm going to have x1, x2, x3, x4. I'm going to repeat it 10,000 times. And here is the secret mean. In real life, of course, you never know the secret mean. But because we're doing a dopey map experiment, Here's the secret mean. It's 3, 0, negative 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So we're in 10 dimensions. Everything is a vector in r to the 10. And you have a 3 in the first one, a negative 4 in the third one, and all the rest are 0. So the number of variables is just the length of this vector. And here is me generating the data. So I just generate uh, standard Gaussian variables, mean 0, variance 1, and then I add on the secret, the secret mean. And there is the data. OK. And there you go. So to start with, we want to come up with the unbiased estimation. How do you estimate secret mean? So we're given these data points. How do you estimate? What is the formula for an unbiased estimator? Can anyone think of what it would be? How would you estimate the mean given x1, x2, x3, x4? Get the mean of the sample. OK, how do you get the mean of the sample? So I have x1, x2, x3, x4. What does the mean of the sample mean? Yeah, so just add them up. x1, x2, x2, x3, x4, and divide by the number of data points. This is one thing. This is one possible way to do it. That's one way to do it. This way. It is unbiased. Why is it unbiased? We can calculate mathematically. If you do the expected value, right? If you average over all possible data, you will see then you will get this one quarter comes out, and then you get the expected value of x1 plus the expected value of x2 plus the expected value of x3 plus the expected value of x4. OK? And that's because expected values are linear. And each of these is equal to mu secret. So you have four copies of mu secret, secret, how about that, plus mu secret. You're adding the vector to itself four times, and then you divide by four. That's exactly mu secret. So our estimator, on average, is equal to the true value. So this is unbiased. Are there any other unbiased ones? So this is unbiased check unbiased, which means on average it's correct. Are there other unbiased ones? Could you make a different unbiased estimator that is not exactly that? So there are lots of other unbiased ones. If I tell you what they are, you're going to say, oh, that's silly. That, that's dumb. Why would anyone do that? So if you have four data points, OK, there's an episode of The Big Bang Theory. You guys ever watch The Big Bang Theory? Yeah. So, so there's an episode where they go to a restaurant, and there's three of them. And they're ordering some like spring rolls or something. And it comes as four spring rolls. And he's like, OK, but only bring three, because 
there's only three of us. And then the waiter's like, no, I have to bring four. And then they have this like big argument. And they're like, okay, why don't you, why don't you bring it? And on the way here, you drop one, okay? <laughs> That's the conclusion. So here I gave you four, x1, x2, x3, x4. What happens if on the way to coming with x1, x2, x3, x4, we drop one of them? We take x4, we drop it. Oh no, it fell on the floor. Now we have x1, x2, x3 only. Can you make an estimator out of x1, x2, x3 that is unbiased? Uh, well, yeah, what we're doing is essentially leave one out. But look, you told me to average x1, x2, x3, x4. What happens if I average just x1, x2, x3? So here's another one. Option, let's call this uh, option number three, because there's three of them. This was, this was four. What? x1 plus x2 plus x3, and what I want to do plus zero times x4 just to make it really clear that x4 is excluded from the party. Will this one be unbiased? Is this a valid estimator? Yeah, okay, let's see, is it biased? So how do we tell if it's biased? So you think it's biased because it's, I, I did some weird weight, but let's do the expected value of the data. Let's call this mu secret three. Mu secret number three, because there's three of them. Uh, let's do the expected value of this guy. And what will happen is this one third will come out and then you'll have the expected value of all of them. X2, X3. Okay, and then you have the zero over here. That zero is just gonna be a zero. So you have a third and then the expected value three times. A third is exactly gonna kill adding a number to itself three times. So you get back the expected value of any of them which is mu secret. Let me just write mu secret. Mu secret. So this one is unbiased too. Of course, you can do lots of variations on this. Instead of doing a third, a third, a third, zero, right? The sort of weights were a third for x1, a third for x2, a third for x3, zero. You can do any numbers you want that add up to one, right? You could do 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, zero. That would work. You could do, I don't know, just x1. You know, just say one, zero, zero, zero. Uh, we're going to do just x1. Uh, so which is best? What is the best? So here, there are, therefore, what's the conclusion? There are infinitely many, uh, many, many unbiased estimators. Right? Anytime you choose some weights that sum up to one, you can make an unbiased estimator by just adding them up, uh, right? So a, a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2 plus dot 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 plus, uh, let's say, a n data times x n data. That will be unbiased as long as the, the sum of the a's is equal to one. So which one is the best? How to choose? How to choose? Of all these available, How do you choose which unbiased estimator is the best unbiased estimator? What do you think? Which one's the best one? Do you think, it's, you think this one's better? Where you just leave, you forget about number four, you pretend number four fell on the ground. Is that a good idea? Is that gonna be better than the other one? So people are shaking their heads. How would you tell? Like mathematically, right? I, if I come up to you and I say, I think this one is the best, how would you prove that, uh, say, this one, which is a lot more reasonable, how do you prove that that one's better? Because you're considering all the data points. Okay, why is considering all the data points better? Because you're getting the average of this entire sample. Over here, you're manipulating the sample, basically. You're sure, I mean, it's all true, like morally speaking, and it makes perfect sense, like logically, right? 100% yeah. right. This one is so silly. You just took one and threw it away. Of course, it's going to be worse than if you have more data. More data should be better than less data, right? So can you explain mathematically? Is there like a way you could measure how well it's doing and say like, look, I, did, I took the ruler and I measured it, and this number is a worse number than that number? Mean the mean squared error. OK, this is great. So let's measure the mean squared error. The mean squared error. Let's do the mean squared error for, uh, let's say, the estimator with four, four things. 
you have with four things versus the mean squared error for the estimator with three things. Okay, uh, and the mu came out funny because the computer paused. Okay, there. and if you calculate the mean squared error for these things, the mean squared error with this one will be depend on uh, one over four times the variance of the x's, and this one will be one third times the variance of the x's. So I will skip the calculation, but this is a good exercise if you want to make sure you understand mean squared error uh, to do the calculation, fill in the dots. Why is one of them a quarter? Why is the other one a third? This is the, we've done this calculation before in the first couple of weeks of class, so I won't do it again. But the point is, you can do it, and you can calculate exactly what it is. So they are unbiased. The mean squared error, by the way, is exactly equal to the variance because they're un unbiased. So this is the variance. And a quarter is less than a third, so that is why this one is better. It has lower variance. They are both on average right, and if you draw a histogram of the spread around that average, this one, the mu4, will be tighter around the true value than this one. And that is why it is better. Okay, so now we're warmed up. We know this thing is unbiased. We know this idea of trying to measure how big the error is. Any questions or comments so far? Okay, so let's see. In the unbiased estimation, I exactly wrote this formula. Please add them up. Uh, and then I repeated the experiment n sample times. So I repeated it 10,000 times. So here is the, uh, the, the estimation. So mu hats, right? Uh, it's really, it's one mu hat vector, but for every single sample. And I repeated it 10,000 times. So mu hats is a vector with 10,000 entries. And then I computed the mean squared error for every single one. Uh, so the mean squared error. So MSEs should be something with of size 10,000 that tells you the mean squared error for every single sample. Let's, let's check the variable explorer over here and make sure uh, that it did what we wanted. Do I have to run? Do I have to run it all? Maybe I didn't run it. Run all, let's run all. Oh no, it's not trusted, okay. So MSEs, well, tell me what they are. Okay, MSEs is an array with 10,000 entries. This is the mean squared error for the first one, the mean squared error for the second one, and so on. And on average, it was 0 0.249. Why was it 0 0.249? Well, we just said it's a quarter times the variance, and we made the variance one. So it should be 0 0.25. 0 0.25 is the theoretical value. We ran it 10,000 times. And it was 0.249, so pretty close. So that's the mean squared error of this unbiased estimator, and you can prove that this is the best, unpos best possible unbiased estimator. So the best possible, if you use an unbiased estimator, is 0.25. And here is a plot of what they look like. So, uh, oh, I thought I fixed this bug. Okay, this, this is interesting. Uh, okay. So if you, dist plot is no longer used. You need to change it to hist plot, but okay, we'll, we'll leave it. Um, so this is a histogram of the first component, variable zero, right? The first entry is on average is three. So the dotted line at three is the real value, and the blue histogram shows you what we came up with, right? And sometimes we estimated a little bit higher than three. Sometimes we estimated a little bit lower than three. That is the histogram of our 10,000 samples. And same thing for variable one. The true value was zero. Sometimes we estimated a little higher than zero. Sometimes we were a little bit lower than zero, and so on. Same thing for variable two. But on average, we're correct. So we can see from this plot that we're unbiased. On average, we got it right on. And we can sort of see the spread in each variable, right? Between sort of plus minus one in each thing. The total mean squared error is going to sum over all the variables, right? It's how far you are off on average. So it's summing the squares of variable zero, variable one, variable two, and so on. So that maybe I should mention this mean squared error in this case. Uh, oh, so I might be missing a factor here. But okay, the mean squared error, mean squared error, uh, is the expected value of how far the average is from the true average. So one of them is estimated, one of them is the true, the true thing. So the, the estimate versus the true secret square, and I'll take the norm square of the vector. Okay. So there we are. Okay. So far, very boring just stuff we did before. Now things get totally insane, which is we're gonna look at the James Stein estimator. 
and there was this video you were supposed to watch about the James Stein estimator, and it's this really crazy idea, which is you calculate some constant, this lambda James Stein, and then you just multiply, you multiply what we had before, what we were doing before, you multiply it by this lambda. So this is the new stuff for today, which is the James, James Stein, Stein estimator. Okay, you calculate some constant, lambda js, there's some formula, formula, it's some formula, but at the end you get a number that is presumably less than one. I think it's usually between zero and one. Uh, and then you just say, use the estimator, mu hat James Stein is what? It's lambda, this whatever lambda you computed, times the old estimator. So let's do one over the number of data points, and then we'll add up the data. So this is what we had before, adding up the xi's and divide by this. And then we just multiply by a number. It's like we multiply it by like 0.5. We take whatever we had before and we shrink it by this factor of lambda. Of lambda. Shrink by lambda. So this is saying, instead of using the formula, add them up and make sure the weights add up to one. Now the weights are going to add up to less than one. You're going to have a quarter times lambda for the first one, a quarter times lambda for the next one, and so on. So another way to think about it is that this is uh, lambda divided by 4 times x1 plus lambda divided by 4 times x2 plus lambda divided by 4 times x3 plus lambda divided by 4 times x4. We're, so we're still doing an equal mix of x1, x2, x3, x4, but instead of having them each with weight a quarter, now they have weight lambda divided by a quarter, uh, divided by 4. So the sum, so the sum of weights, the total sum, sum of weights, is lambda, which is less than 1. And because this is less than 1, this is no longer unbiased. Now there's a bias, right? Before, we were right on exactly, and now we are wrong. So now the expected value, say, of... Okay, the computer doesn't like me. Let's try again. Uh, the expected value of the James Stein estimator uh, is, in some sense, less than, less than the true secret value. Okay, I put less than in quotes. You, you can't really write the equation that this is less than this. Why can't I just write less than here? It would be mathematically wrong to write less than. Before it was fine, I wrote equals and everything was fine. But why can't I write less than? This is like morally true, right? The sum of the weights is less than one. This, is, this thing is lambda times the other thing times this thing, uh, the unbiased. And the unbiased one was equal, and lambda is less than 1. So why can't I write the less than? So before they were equal, I multiplied it by a lambda. Lambda is less than 1. But it's not true that this is less than this. Okay. You guys seem confused by this, so maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't even write this in quotes. I should not write this at all. What is the relationship between this guy and this guy? First of all, what type of object are they? What type of thing is that? Let's say a mu secret. Is that a number? Like seven? Yeah. No, it's not a number. It's, an it's a what? Yes, it's like an array or a vector. This is a vector. This is a vector. What about on this side of the equation? Also a vector. Okay, good. So we have two vectors, right? Where they have components. They have many components. Look, here are some pictures of the components, right? Here was variable zero, right? Variable one. They have many components. And so you can say two vectors are equal, right? That makes perfect sense. Vector over here, vector over there. If they're the exact same vector, then they're equal. What does it mean to say Two vectors are less than each other. Doesn't mean anything, right? Less than is something you do for numbers, not for vectors. It's confusing because equals you can do for vectors and numbers. So before it was fine, but now we gotta be careful. So it's not true like that. Let's try looking at the components. 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 So I shrunk it by lambda. Let's look at the component mu hat js. Let's look at the ith component, i. 
versus mu secret comma i. So now look at the ith component, right? The vector is made of 10 different numbers. Let's look at each one individually. Now, is it true that I, I can put a less than? Question mark. Now is it true? Or you can just put like magnitude of each. Uh, uh, the ma where do you, so the problem is if you put the magnitude inside here, yeah. then the expected value of the magnitude is not the same as the magnitude of the expected value. So you're changing the equation. So I, I don't want to put a magnitude yet. Uh, the magnitude will, will bamboozle things. Let's, let's decide if it's bigger or less than. The magnitude, I think, just confuses what's going on a little bit. So is it true with a less than sign? Yeah. True? OK, so now they're both numbers. Who thinks it's true? Who thinks it's not true? Who needs more time to think about it? Everybody. OK, take a minute and think. Is it true with a less than sign? I will give you time to think. See if you're following along with what we're doing here. I took the vector, I multiplied it by lambda. What's happening? Okay, let's make this let's make this an official vote. Because you guys I'll give one more minute, but now it is open as a, as a question on Mathematize. You can, A is yes, it's true, and B is no, it's not true. So please select what you think. I have to press start. Please select what you think. Is it true or not true? And we'll see what people think. Okay, there's like 10 seconds left. Who needs more time? Okay, nobody. Let's see what people said then. Okay. Is it true or false? Let us reveal what people said. I want to reveal counts. Okay, what do I have to do? Click here. 14 responses. Eight people said A and seven people said B. Very good 50-50 split of the class. Does someone want to tell me why it's Either true or not true? Okay, if it could be a negative number, what happens if it's negative? I see. So, for example, let's say if it's negative 2. Sure. Yes, okay, so I think this example perfectly works. If you have a negative component, okay, not the vector, the vector can't be negative, but the component can be negative too, and then if you multiply by a small number, really what we're doing, you should think of, we're shrinking, right? And shrinking, if you are a negative number, I guess for you guys, negatives on this side, shrinking means going closer to zero, and going closer to zero does not mean less than. Going closer to zero means closer to zero. If you're a positive number, then that will be less than, if you're a negative number, it will be greater than. So the thing you should think of is that it gets closer to zero. You could write it with absolute values in some way. The absolute value of one, but don't write it with absolute values. Just imagine closer to zero. So that's what we're doing. So the answer, of course, is B. It is not true. Congratulations to the seven people who picked B, who thought of these negative numbers. We are shrinking towards zero. That's what we're doing. 
we're not necessarily going down, but we are shrinking. Okay, so very good. So we're shrinking. So this is what it looks like. So you calculate this funny thing, you shrink it, and then you shrink it. I ran the experiment a bunch of times, so here's the calculation for the shrink factor, which will be a vector of size 10,000, because I did it once for every possible experiment. And you can take the average. So it's some number between 0 and 1. On average, it was 0 0.92. So we can look at what the actual uh, thing is if we go to the variable explorer. Um, what do I call it? Shrink factor. Shrink factor. See, it's a vector of size 10,000. In the first experiment, it was 0 0.93. In the next experiment, it was 0 0.928. And then it was 0 0.911. And then it was 0 0.95. So it's a number between 0 and 1. And on average, it's like 0 0.92. Um, and every time we run it, we got a different thing. It depends on the data. And we're shrinking by a little bit. And here is the miraculous thing. Before, we did it. And we got a mean squared error of 0 0.25. And now, we have a z an average mean squared error of 0 0.23. So the mean squared error went down by a little bit. We have this unbiased thing. That was worse than just making a biased thing, multiplying it by this funny number, this James Stein thing. And here is a plot of what the estimates look like. So variable zero, there's the true value. Maybe I can zoom out one so we can see the whole, the whole plot. So there's the true value was three, and that blue histogram shows our estimates. And our estimates are not centered at three, right? On average, we're a little bit shrunk, right? We're on average, we're like 0 0.25 something. We are not right on average. So if you showed me this and you were like, oh, look at how, how well are you doing? You'd be like, oh, you're doing, you're doing it wrong. Look, you have, you're not right. It's, too far to the left, push it to the right a little bit more. And it turns out, pushing it a little bit to the right is giving you a worse error. That's not good. So for some weird reason, this is better. So this is the variable zero, the average was three. Here's variable one, the average was zero. This one, because the average was zero, this one happens to be unbiased, right? We did zero, it was zero before, we multiplied it by a constant. And here is an example where it's negative, right? Variable two, the true answer was negative four. And the James sign estimator multiplies it by like 0.9. In this case, it makes it a little bit larger, right? It shrinks it towards zero, makes it a little larger. So here is the reason why does this work? Why does the James Stein estimator work? Why is it giving a better error? So if you watch the video, there's a longer video with even more details that explains in theory, like in a lot of detail, exactly what's happening with the James Stein estimator and why it's always a little bit less. But I'll give you the very short version is that you can always decompose the mean squared error, the mean squared error, that's what we care about. This has two parts. And one part is the variance, the variance. And the other part is the bias squared, the bias squared. This is the kind of decom decomposition we did in the first few weeks of class. We talked about the variance bias decomposition. That's what it is. It says the mean squared error is the sum of two things. And when you are unbiased, one of these things is zero. So when you're unbiased, that term is zero. So the James Stein estimator has a non-zero term here. Let's compare what this decomposition looks like. Let's do the ordinary. Let's do the mean squared error. Mean squared error for the ordinary, ordinary average. So that is the variance. Remember, it was actually 1 over n times the variance of x. Uh, that's what it was when we calculated it. We averaged n things, and I said it's 1 over n times the, the variance. It was 1 quarter times the variance data. And then there was bias. But the bias was 0, 0 squared. So that's the mean squared error for the ordinary thing. That's why it came out to 0 0.25, because we were doing four numbers. So it was 1 quarter, 0 0.25. The mean squared error for the James Stein is more, much more complicated for the James Stein. But some parts of it are actually quite simple. And the part that is quite simple is the variance part. Because if you take something and you multiply it by lambda, then you multiply the variance by lambda squared. Lambda squared. So very approximately speaking, because of course lambda is actually a random number and it depends on the data. Um, but we're multiplying the variance by lambda squared. And so this term, this, this goes down. Because lambda is between 0 and 1, this term shrinks the variance, lower variance. Of course, there is a price to pay for lower variance, and that is you have some bias. So you're going to have some non-zero non -zero bias. Okay.
So we made it bigger by making it biased, but we also, this, and this is the important part, the counterintuitive part is that we made the total mean squared error smaller because we made the variance smaller. And this is why all these methods are shrinkage met methods. You'll never see one that's a blowing up method. If you blow it up and you make it biased, now it's really bad. It, both are bad. So the whole secret sauce here is we're making the bias bad, but we're doing it in a way that makes the variance better. And if you do it in a really smart way, and that's what these James Stein people did, it works so that the whole thing is less than the original, right? You gotta be careful with how you do it, because if you do it wrong, maybe you make this term way too big, and this term uh, doesn't compensate, right? So you need, to make, you need to choose it in the right way so that the shrinkage you get in the variance outweighs the boost you get in the bias. So that's what's going on. So this, this, this term is up, the bias term went up before it was zero, which is the best possible. Now it's non-zero, that's bad. The variance went down. And the James Stein people were so clever, and they came up with a really smart way, this really fancy formula, which looks like this. Is the formula written somewhere? Uh, there's the formula. Really fancy formula. And they made sure, they have a proof, that if you do the formula just like this, then it always works in your favor. The, the amount you reduce the variance will always outweigh the amount that the bias went up. And that is why the whole thing went down. In this particular situation, it went down by like 0.02. It was 0 0.25 before, and now it's 0 0.23. All right. Any questions or comments about this James Stein business? So here is the question for you, if you think you understand this. Here is the question that we're going to do next. Instead of using, I mean, let me present this. Instead of using the James Stein factor, which is some complicated formula, what if we just did a constant? So we just let lambda equal 0.9, and we try this shrinkage thing. We shrink it down uh, by 0.9. So we say, look, this, I'm, uh, this, this, this formula for the James Stein, the lambda James Stein, is too complicated. Let's try something simpler. Try simpler. And the simpler thing is, instead of lambda James Stein is some complicated function, that's what it was before. And I'm not even going to worry about what the actual function is. We're going to throw this away, and we're just going to do lambda equals 0 0.9 and try it. Try it. So is it possible that this will work? Can we just make lambda equals 0 0.9 and then just do the estimator? Uh, mu hat, I guess, lambda is lambda times the mu hat unbiased. So instead of making it depend on the data, just make it multiply by lambda. What would happen? Could this work? And what options did I give you? Oh, I, first of all, I haven't set up select all that apply. Of course, you can't select all that apply because they're opposites of each other. So select one. And do you think it's possible it can work or no, that won't work? Those are the two choices. I'll give you one minute to think about how is the James Stein estimator working? Would this work? Okay, 10 seconds off to put in your, what do you think? Do you think it, it could work? Or do you think we're missing some fundamental ingredient? All right, so let's take a look at what people said. Nine people said, no, that won't work. Six people said, yes, it could work. The answer is, it could work, it could work. Let's see what happens when we do it. Let's see what happens when we do it. So there's nothing fundamental about this special formula. The whole thing is just that we are shrinking the variance. That is the whole trick. So let's take a look at what would happen. So let's try a fixed lambda. 
We're just going to pick our favorite lambda, maybe 0 0.9, and try it. And so I have this function called try shrink factors. And this tries more than one at once. So instead of just doing 0.9, I'm going to try 0.9 and 0.8 and 0.7. I'm going to try all of them and just plot the result. And it makes this nice graph, which is mean squared error versus shrink factor. So the shrink factor here is on the x-axis. So the computer tried a shrink factor of 1. Of course, a shrink factor of 1.0 means don't do anything, right? Multiply it by 1.0. A shrink factor of 0 0.9 means multiply it by 0 0.9, and so on. A shrink factor of 0 means you just always guess 0, right? You take whatever the answer is, you multiply it by 0. You get the 0 vector. So when the shrink factor is 0, you're saying, I think the answer is 0. Okay, so very, this one is very silly. And on the y-axis, I have the mean squared error. When you do a shrink factor of 1, you should get exactly a quarter, which it does. When you have a shrink factor of 0, then you will get the norm of the vector we're looking at. The vector we're looking at is the vector with a 3 and a 4. So its norm is, uh, I think, uh, 2.5. Exactly, yeah. Because 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5. 5 squared. So you get exactly 2.5. And in between, you have this nice curve of things. So if you shrink, um, you will get different things. And of course, it looks like if you shrink by a lot, you increase the error, right? If you're at 0.4 and you make you shrink even more, you're doing worse and worse and worse and worse. But the very exciting thing is if you look very carefully down here, there is a little sweet spot where if you shrink by just a tiny bit, so don't shrink too much. If you shrink by too much, then you're way off, right? But if you shrink by just a tiny bit, then you do improve the mean squared error. And I zoomed in, so here's the same plot, but only plotted between 0.8 and 1.0. And so here is the same plot with the shrink factors between 0 0.8 and 1.0. 1.0 is doing nothing. 0 0.8 is multiplying the whole thing by 0 0.8. And it looks like there's a sweet spot right in between at 0 0.91. That if you shrink by 0 0.91, then you improve the mean squared error. It improves from 0 0.25 down to 0 0.22, right? So this is like, it's actually, it seems like a small improvement, but this is like a 15 or 20% improvement. Like a lot of people will pay a lot of money for a 15 or 20 percent improvement with no extra data cost or anything, right? This is a sort of a free improvement. So the answer is, yes, you can improve it if you do the right amount of shrinkage, right? So it can work as long as the shrink factor is tuned just right. And if you look at our decomposition, you can really see why, that, why that's happening. As you increase the shrink factor, or as you decrease it rather, so if you make the shrink factor very close to zero, you have lowering the variance, that's good, but you're increasing the bias. And at some point, increasing the bias outweighs decreasing the variance. So you need to get that exact right sweet spot of just enough that the bias is not so big that it outweighs the gains from the variance. And in this particular problem, it came out to 0.91. Uh, okay, so any questions or comments about that? I think this is very counterintuitive. This is like, you know, you take the estimate, it's like obviously you should do a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. And it's like, no, the, the optimal thing is 0.91 times a quarter, 0.91 times a quarter, 0.91 times a quarter. So like this, this silly idea of doing a third, a third, a third, zero, in some sense was like closer. And you know, this is not the obvious thing to do. I, I find this so mind blowing the first time I heard about this. This seems like wrong, uh, but, but that's, that's the way it is. And it really is because of this variance term. This variance term is the thing people don't think about. And if you can decrease the variance term at the cost of increasing the bias by a little bit, then it's worth it. Then it's worth it. Uh, OK. Any questions or comments about this? Was that the value of lambda determined by uh, James Stein estimator? Ah, so the value of lambda here, uh, in principle, has nothing to do with the James Stein estimator. Like the James Stein estimator. Would James Stein, I think, is close to that? Because yeah, so. so Right, so, so the first thing to clarify is that this has nothing to do with James Stein. Like, we could live in a universe where James and Stein never discovered their thing, and this would make perfect sense. On the other hand, if you look at the James Stein estimator, they have a very complicated formula, right, which has some complicated things in it, and it worked out that their average factor was 0 0.92. So they had some complicated formula, and, you know, they were cooking up a bunch of things together, and at the end of the day, their, their thing on average is 0 0.92. And you can see that at 0 0.92 is not exactly the minimum. It's not the exact minimum, but it's quite close. So the James Stein estimator is cooked up in such a way that it is never too far from the sweet spot. In some sense, it's always helping a bit. And it's cooked up in a way that, it, well, is sort of guaranteed to work. Um, yeah, great question. Anybody else for, for questions? 
Okay. Uh, let me see. What is the next question? Well, how did I word this in? Okay. So this is the thing about doing fun little games in in a, in a, a Python notebooks where I can repeat the experiment many times. I made this graph. This is a graph of the true mean squared error versus something, right? This is the mean squared error on the y-axis versus the shrink factor. In real life, if you knew the mean squared error, then you know the answer, right? The mean squared error is like, how far away are you from the true answer? If you know the true answer, then why are we doing this? This is silly. In real life, you will never ever know the true mean squared error. Um, so what can we do instead, right? We cannot do this. You can't find the sweet spot of 0.91 by plotting this and just taking the minimum. And you cannot do that. But what can you do? That's the question. We can estimate the mean squared error by using blank. And give me your favorite 30 character word. Uh, put dots in between. What can you do instead of knowing the true mean squared error? Okay, put in your guesses for your favorite word of what you would do instead of knowing the true mean squared error, right? So the true mean squared error, I only know it because I'm, I'm doing a, a fun thing where I know the actual value. In real life, you don't know the actual value. So what can you do? So these are some, some people don't know. Uh, so you could use the James Stein estimator. <laughs> this is a good, a good trick. The James Stein estimator is cooked up to exactly work. Uh, unfortunately, the James Simon estimator only works specifically for this estimation problem. So it only works for calculating the mean. Sometimes you want to calculate, for example, the coefficients in the linear regression. So the James Simon estimator would be great. Uh, it's kind of more of a theoretical like thing that shows you something crazy as possible. In practice, um, you don't typically use it. Although, I guess if you were doing the mean, you could use it. Uh, uh, so one person wrote training data, and that is almost the right thing. So the training data is what is used to get our estimate for the mean, right? And, and what I'm saying is we want to do a two-part process, right? We're going to have our new formula is lambda times the, this unbiased thing. And this unbiased thing, this comes from the training data. Training data, right? But this lambda, we want to be able to figure it out. And how can we do it? So one, two people wrote cross-validation and cross-validation is the idea of using a test set to figure things out. And that is exactly what we want to do. So we're going to find out this lambda. Uh, use the test set. Use the test set. And like specifically, what do I mean? I mean estimate, estimate the mean squared error using a test set. So instead of knowing the true mean squared error and having a really nice, beautiful quadratic curve, you won't have that, but you'll have something that's approximately like it. And did I include it on here? Uh, I, I did not, but I have it on the next one. So in this example, everything was sort of artificial and like you get this nice curve. You can't do that in real life, but you can estimate what this curve is and find the optimal value of lambda by using the test set, right? So by just checking, you, we're gonna try a bunch of different shrink factors and we'll see which shrink factor is the best on the test set. And then once we know which shrink factor is the best on the test set, we can hopefully hope that that is like 0.91 is close to the true value. Um, and if you do it in a fancy way, then you do it with cross-validation. So that's what we're going to do on the next, uh, the next little notebook over here. So this is the idea, which I guess maybe a lot of people didn't think of. Um, yeah, any questions or comments about this idea? So you can't get the real mean squared error but you can always estimate it, and you can find the value that 
optimizes the error on the test set. This is just like when we did forward selection. We said we're going to try lots of different numbers of variables, and we'll pick the best one on the test set and go with that. Questions or comments? All right. So that was all estimating the mean. But what if we want to do regression, right? So before we were estimating the mean, now I want to do a regression. I want to estimate those coefficients, beta hat 1, beta hat 2, and so on. So how could you apply this shrinkage idea? And this is an apply, select all that apply. So here are two different ideas. And uh, you tell me what you think. Do you think these will work? I'll let you read them and take a minute. I don't want a clock. Oh, no. Okay, let's see what people chose. Which of these will work? And people chose. So 15 people said to add a penalty term. Only nine people said to multiply all coefficients. And it, the, the truth is both of these will work. Both of these things will work. So this idea of adding a penalty term, this is the classical thing people call ridge regression or L2 regularization. We'll talk a lot about this. But multiplying all the coefficients by some constant would work in the same way we just saw. So it would reduce the variance slightly, and uh, you would be biased, right? Instead of having exactly the beta hat that came out of the computer, you would have a slightly shrunk value, so closer to zero. So you would have some bias. But as long as lambda was chosen right, then you could reduce the variance at the cost of increasing the bias. And if you do it just right, then you can improve the model. So this will work. It's just that it doesn't work as well as this. So this is very common. And people like this one. So the goal is to shrink. The goal is to shrink the parameters. Goal is to shrink parameters. Shrink the parameters. And why does this work? This works for the same reason it worked for the James Stein whole business, is that we reduce variance. Reduce variance. Remember, reducing variance is exactly the same idea as reducing overfitting, right? So reduce variance, that's the same idea as reducing overfitting. Overfitting is when you have very high variance and uh, low bias. So what we're doing is we're artificially adding in some bias to, at the, to reduce the variance. So we're sort of like pulling ourselves away from this overfitting regime of uh, a high variance to try to lower the variance by shrinking the parameters. And so one way is to just multiply all the parameters by lambda, but the more common way is to change the objective function. So how we are going to modify modify the objective function. So before we were doing the minimum, we were saying find beta, so the loss function as of 
if you tell me the parameter is beta, the loss we assigned was the mean squared loss. So the mean squared loss was the sum of yi minus, uh, let's write it like this, beta times xi uh, squared. Right, so the x's are the, uh, the inputs. We multiply by beta. And then we compare that to the true value y. And the closer you are, the less penalty you get. We add it all up. Um, you could think of these x's and betas as vectors. And we're like doing a dot product here or something. If you want to have more than one. Or you can just think of there's only one, one x. Um, in any case, that was what we had before. And what we're just adding on is one simple term. We're saying we're going to add on a term that just depends on the size of the betas squared. Uh, and let me write it out really explicitly. Let's write it out like this. The sum of i equals 1 to the dimension, dimension of beta i squared. So that term wasn't there before. And now we've added this term in. And what does this term do? It's saying, look, yes, you do want to make this as close to 0 as possible. But you also want to make the betas as small as you can. So please, when you're optimizing, Please try to keep in mind, I would like the betas to be small. Don't make any large betas. If you make a large beta, then you get a big loss from this term. If you pick the optimal beta, you get a small loss from this term, and now you have to balance. And so the overall effect is somehow indirectly, the overall effect, the overall effect is to shrink, shrink the betas. Shrink betas. So compared to what they were before, now they've gotten shrunk a bit. And by tuning this value alpha, so this alpha is a new hyperparameter. Alpha is a tuning hyperparameter. By making this either smaller or larger, we can change how much we're shrinking. If you make alpha really, really big, but saying pay a lot of attention to this term. Please make sure that the betas are not too big. That'll shrink them a lot, right? If alpha is a million, then it really wants to make sure that this number is a small number. If alpha is exactly zero, then you haven't done anything. That's exactly the case we had before. And if alpha is some number in between zero and a million, it's something in between. So small values of alpha will shrink a tiny bit. Big values of alpha will shrink a lot. And the whole idea is that by shrinking, we hope that we are reducing the variance. OK, so we're going to do uh, an example in a second. Any questions or comments so far? That's how it works. That's the idea. Uh, so let's see what it looks like in practice. And I've taken a notebook we've already seen before, and I've just modified it. We took too long. OK, well, let's run, run everything from the beginning. OK, so this is one, a notebook we've seen before, where we had some secret data. There was x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and there was two y's, y1 and y2. And this is the one where I tried to tell you guys that the correlation doesn't tell you everything. So x1, x2, x3, x4, x5 are highly correlated. Here's their correlation matrix. But they have very different effects on y1 and y2. So on y1 and y2, if you just look at one variable at a time, they look very similar. But if you look at all the variables at once, you get two very different things for the forward selection. So here's y1. y1 secretly depends only on one of the variables. And if you do forward variable selection, you will find out that one variable is the best. Using one variable, this is the number of variables, has the lowest test error. Um, y2 has four variables. Y2 is given by four variables. And forward selection found out that using four variables is the best. So this is exactly what we did before. This was our, our like mathematical demonstration of forward variable selection, again with linear regression. right? So how did this work? Is the computer tried linear regression with one variable, it tried it with two variables, it tried it with three variables, it tried it with four, and it found, hey, look, four is the best, right? If you go to five, then you start overfitting, you get worse test error. And that was all just by running linear regression many, many times and trying it out and seeing what is the test error on the held up test set. So we're going to do the exact same thing as before. Before, the hyperparameter we had was the number of variables. Try it with one, try it with two, try it with three, try it with four. We're going to do the exact same thing, but just try it with different values of alpha. So try, try uh, the model, the model uh, with different values of alpha, with uh, different alpha values, and see which is the best. Right? And the one that has the lowest test error will go that way. That'll be our choice. So let's see what that looks like. Um, and so again, 
I'm using this, this whole shebang. Sometimes it's called ridge regression. Uh, I have scoured the internet. I have no idea why it's called ridge regression. It has, as far as I can tell, it has nothing to do with ridges. So I don't know why they named it this. The other name you can, you can see is sometimes it's called L2 regularization. And that's because that one makes sense to me. This thing over here, this is the L2 norm of the beta. So we're saying, look, you've got to chill out the betas by how big their L2 norm is. Chilling out, I guess, is called regularizing. You're making it more regular. Regularizing. So this is chilling out, regularizing with the L2 norm. L2 regularization. Uh, OK, so yeah, so this, this thing is the L2 norm of the betas thought of as a vector times this parameter alpha. And that's what we're using. So we're doing exactly this objective function, and let's see how it works. So um, the nice thing is that uh, all of this is in sklearn that we've been using. So if you input the function ridge, it will just do linear regression, except it has a spot for a parameter uh, alpha. So uh, if you run the ridge model dot set params, and you say alpha equals some number, then it will run linear regression, and it, except for it will exactly put in this term alpha over here. So that's called alpha, and we're really adding that on. And what I'm doing is I'm looping through a bunch of different alphas. So A is going through some big grid of values. And the grid I chose is all the values from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the 3. So starting at 0 0.01 and going all the way up to 1,000. But don't go up by unit intervals. Go up exponentially. So do you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Um, do a whole bunch of things in between uh, 10 to the minus 2 and 10 cubed. And we're just going to try them all. So I set the parameter to alpha to that. I train the model only on the training set. This is important. I have a train test split, right? So I took the data that I was given and I split it into a training and test split. I train the model only on the training set. And then I test the model. I see how well did it do on the test set. That, and I test the predictions. I find the root mean squared error. So this is just like we did with forward selection, except for instead of trying different numbers of variables, the only thing I'm doing is trying different values of alpha. So the value of alpha is changing from place to place. And then, OK, I guess I copy and pasted the code twice because I'm silly. Oh, this is the training error. OK, good. So this is the test error, and this is the training error. And that way, we can compare and see them. Of course, we only care about the test error, but it's good to know um, what it's doing to the training error. So this is just for our understanding. OK. And then I took the best possible value. So I fed what is the best possible value according to the test set. And then I plotted everything. So here is what the plot looks like. Here is what the plot looks like. Uh, OK. So very cool looking plots. Let's go over them. So the first, the first plot on the x-axis is that value of alpha, starting at 10 to the minus 2 and ending at 10 to the 3. And the computer tried lots of values in between and just connected the dots. So there's enough dots that it looks like a smooth curve. And what is being plotted here is the value of the coefficients. So, right when you do, uh, when you estimate, when you do uh, y1, you're going to get y1 equals. You're going to do beta zero times x zero plus beta one times x one plus beta two times x two plus dot 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 plus beta I think five times x five is the last one. And these values of beta, they depend on alpha, right? They each depend on alpha. They are actually a function of alpha, because as you change alpha, these values change. And it, it, everything should be set up so that as you increase alpha, they shrink towards zero, right? What, where we said when alpha is really, really big, then the loss function will prioritize shrinking down this term. And so it will make the betas very small. When alpha is zero, then it will just leave them alone. And so it should shrink them as alpha increases. Let's see what it looks like. So here is what it looks like. And you can see that it really is shrinking them towards zero, right? So they start out for very small values of beta, when beta is 10 to the minus 2, or very close to 0, they are these numbers. And then as you increase the alpha value, the numbers all shrink in towards 0. And when alpha equals 10,000, then all the coefficients, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4, and beta 5, are all 0. So this is what it's doing. And so what you can see that when we ran just ordinary linear regression, the value of beta 1 is quite high, the value of beta 2 is quite high. Um, and negative. And I'll tell you, I can tell you one thing for sure, because I made this, this is all, all secret data, only x1 is the real thing. Everything else is noise. So if you look at how was y1 created, the function for y1 
is literally just, uh, it's, it's in here in the secret function. We can look in the secret function. Y1 is just 2 times x1. Y1 is really, in reality, 2 times x1. And uh, so everything else that we found here, like the fact that we found x1 is some big number like 3, that's good. But the fact that we found x2 was like negative 3, this is pure noise. This is, we're really wrong here. And we're getting bad estimates because of that. And it just has to do with the fact we have a random subset. OK? So what does ridge regression do? Well, as we increase the alpha parameter, you can see that this bad value of x2, which we know is noise, is shrinking towards 0. And that is why the model is improving. So all the coefficients that were sort of like bad, those get shrunk towards 0. The value of x1 also gets shrunk towards 0. But overall, we've just reduced the variance. These things that happen by chance that are bad, their effect gets minimized. And if you plot the size of the error, then you get a plot that looks like this. So there's three things on this plot. Let me zoom out so we can see everything. Can I do one more? So this is the size of the errors. The blue is the test set error, and the train set error is in orange. And they look almost flat, but if you zoomed in, they would go down and up. So they have, you go down by a bit, you reduce the variance by a bit, and then it goes up. And you can see that the size of the coefficients, which is up by the size, I mean the, the sum of the squares, that is also shrinking towards 0, just like we said. So the, the coefficients start out over here, and they get shrunk, 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 shrunk. And when you're in this sweet spot, the variance is reduced, and you get a slightly better model. OK. Uh, so this is a nice plot of showing the, the coefficients and the effect of regularization. You can see you get a slightly improved um, error over here. I did the same thing for y2. The difference between y1 and y2 is y1 only depends on x1 in reality. y2 is, depends on x2, x3, x4, and x5. So y, y2 has nothing to do with x1, but has only to do with x2, x3, x4, x5. And so you get a slightly different picture over here. And you can see that, again, x1 is kind of annoying, and we're improving the model because we shrink a bit. We shrink the x1 value, which is kind of wrong. Uh, we shrink that down. Uh, here is what it looks like. You can see the uh, U-shaped curve in the test set here more clearly. As you increase the regularization, you get to the sweet spot where it is minimized. And then if you go too far, it gets worse again. So that blue graph is what we're trying to minimize. Uh, OK. So it is a lot like the overfitting versus underfitting you saw on your project. It's just a different parameter now. It's the ridge regularization parameter uh, that will control this knob between overfitting and underfitting, or at least it will help you avoid overfitting by decreasing the variance by shrinking things. Uh, OK. Are there any questions or comments? OK, so so far today, it's been all like math theory, right? I have this lab, which will do it in real life. So we have this hitters data set, where we're trying to estimate the uh, salary of various baseball players using some information. Um, yeah, you know what? I think we have enough time. I can, I can get you guys started on, the, on this one. I'll start with this. So we have this, we've done this uh, data set before. We have a bunch of different things, like how many times were they at bat, how many hits they got, home runs. And we want to estimate their salary, right? So presumably, the people who are better, those people will uh, get paid more money, right? So we want to estimate their salary. If we do ordinary least squares, we take the data set. It will look just like this. We'll have at bats, hits, home runs, and so on. Uh, okay, and we get some kind of mean squared error. Uh, when you do it with ridge regression, you get a nice plot that looks like this. So this is very similar to what we had before. We had all the different coefficients, uh, and some of them start very negative, and as you increase the parameter, they shrink towards zero. And you can figure out what is the optimal place to stop. Uh, and you can do that with validation. So you do this train test split, and then we're doing the same thing as before. We, we find a grid, and then we check all the parameters in the grid. And what it finds is some best possible value is 0 0.93. And here is what it looks like as a function, the test set mean squared error, as a function of the ridge regression parameter. Right? Here it's close to 0, and you have the ordinary least squares. And then you go by a little bit, it gets a little better, and then it gets worse. OK, so very similar to what we did before, but now on a real life data set. And uh, the thing that I wanted to get to, which I'll get to next class, is that there is a hidden mistake somewhere in this notebook. And you can see this hidden mistake because we have barely any performance boost. So this is what we started with was 
you know, 100,000. This is, so this is 100, this is 105. And we went down by like 2% or something. This is our very tiny improvement. So not very good performance. So it's not really working very well. And if you look also at this graph, you might notice something else uh, that's somewhat annoying. You look at this graph and you look at the coefficients, you'll notice most of the coefficients didn't change very much. They all started at zero, okay? And the reason they all started at zero and didn't change very much is because we did something wrong. Okay, and I'll let you guys think about what we did wrong, and on Thursday, we'll try to correct it. Okay, so we'll, go, we'll finish this one off on Thursday, and we'll find the mistake, and you can get quite a bit more improvement rather than the last couple of percent. Uh, okay, so I'll stop there. Uh, if there's any questions or comments, please come by and see me. I'll be here for a few minutes. Otherwise, have a happy Halloween, and I'll see you guys on uh, Thursday.